Okay. The following interview was conducted with Joseph S. Francisco, the William E. Moore Distinguished, Pro Distinguished Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences and Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, April 23, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Francisco. And thank, thank you, you, Catherine. Thank you okay. so much. Let's uh, start by telling me where and when you were born and your parents and sibling in your early years. Ooh, okay. Um, I was born in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, on March 26, 1955. Uh, my mother's uh, maiden name was uh, Lucinda uh, Lang. And my father, was, uh, his name was Joseph Salvadori Francisco, uh, <clears throat> which is the name I have of his, which is the name of his father and the name of his grandfather. So um, you know, it goes back uh, you know, a bit. My uh, grandfather was an Italian immigrant um, who actually uh, moved to Louisiana for you know, work. Uh, you know, options, opportunities. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my mother and it's a little bit about my father. Two months after I was uh, born, um, my mother and father separated and um, I uh, was brought to my grandparents uh, and asked if they would raise me and uh, they, they took on that responsibility. And so uh, after two months in New Orleans, I moved to Beaumont, Texas, and I grew up in, 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 in Beaumont, Texas. Okay. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have a, uh, well, I had a older sister, mm -hmm. she's a half-sister. Um, uh, her name was uh, Charles uh, Hulbert, but she's deceased, and I have a half-brother from my mother's uh, remarriage. Uh, his name is Solomon Baker. Uh, he's actually four years younger than me. Okay. I'll tell us a little about grade school and high school in Texas, and then go ahead. Any mm, activi okay. activities or what, what went on in high school? Oh, and, all right. Well, uh, in, in Beaumont, uh, I grew up in what they called the Pear Orchard. Actually, two African-American communities in, in Beaumont. Uh, one was in, in, located in the north side of town, and then the other one was sort of located in the southern part of town. And that the African American community, the southern part of town is called the Pear Orchard. Uh, in our community and where I lived, uh, there were a number of uh, professional African Americans, basically doctors, the neighborhood pharmacist, uh, principal, uh, school teachers. Uh, so there are actually a uh, number of good role models on the right. On, Sounds on the, like it. Uh -huh. Yeah, in, in 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 our community, what it means for, was for a number of the kids, uh, the competition was quite high for us, uh, uh, etc. So, a uh, number of kids in our community have actually gone on to, you know, very good schools, uh, and I think that was largely due to the community, uh, you know, where 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 we where we grew up. Um, tell you a little bit about um, uh, my interests. Um, you know, in um, in high school, uh, actually by the tenth grade, my interest was really in music. Uh, you know, I hadn't really discovered the sciences. Um, well, that's not quite true. Let me let me let me back up. My interest was in music. I did discover the sciences. Uh, but it, that that interest hadn't really been cultivated enough. It was a growing interest. But uh, yeah, I was pretty good in music, and my mission at the time was um, to become uh, you know first chair flute player, oboe player in the New York Philharmonic. Uh, Carnegie that, Hall was calling you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, I did fulfill that dream. Uh, and if you remind me in the interview, I'll tell you how all that transpired. Okay. But it was an awesome uh, experience. Uh, I got to perform with the Boston Symphony, um, and I also got to perform with them in Carnegie Hall. So um, very, nice. very, very, very interesting. That's an interesting story on, on that one. Um, but um, 
Were you in the school? You were in the school band then. Well, I was in. I was actually in the school band, uh -huh. and uh, and you know, and, and did that for a number of years. Uh, now, what happened was in in um, middle school. Um, I loved animals and I loved dogs. Uh, when I was growing up, and um, my folks, and we lived in the city, mind you, but I had something like about. Mm, ten dogs, three cats. I had uh, some chickens that I, you know, raised from little chicks, you know, from Easter. I had two rabbits. Uh, oh, just a host of other animals that that I was allowed to wow. sort of raise. And and my folks said, "Son, you have to go get a job to feed your animals." <laughs> we'll take care of you, but you take care of the animals, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> we delegate that. That's right. So, uh, and that, that uh, you know, I got a job uh, working at the local pharmacy, which was across the street, basically cleaning up the pharmacy after school. And so, and on weekends, I would go and clean up and shelve things. Um, and that uh, allowed me to... to to uh, make some money to, to basically buy all the food, uh, you know, for my animals and to get, take good care of them. Good. But that that job turned out to be very important because uh, I moved up from uh, basically uh, the cleaning up the pharmacy to uh, becoming a clerk. Uh, so by the time I got into high school, I was working the cash register, uh, assisting customers. And then um, I got to uh, assist the pharmacist in the back in terms of uh, he allowed me to develop a shelving system for medication so I can easily retrieve. Um, and then he started to teach me the ropes a little bit about the pharmacy business. But then I started reading all the prescription labels uh, as I was trying, and, and then sure. I got fascinated about the chemical structures. and. And I'll say that was one of the first things that, that started to get me a little interested in chemistry. And then the growing interest of having, uh, of making my own rockets, uh, but not having enough money to go out to hobby shop to buy rocket fuel. So I would go to the library and try to figure, read the science books and try to figure out how to make my own rocket fuel. Started with making my own gunpowder. And uh, I realized that. I had all I could figure out all the active ingredients and uh, some of the active ingredients I can get from my backyard. Other active ingredients I can go on the on the railroad uh, tracks and just find the stuff uh, that had boiled over from some of the chemical tankers on the railroad tracks. And then some of the other ingredients I realized that uh, there were some. Uh, Sort of uh, common names and to these things, so I can go to the store, store and get those as as well, and I come back and start experimenting and make my own, uh, uh, you know, gunpowder to make my own rockets. After blowing a hole in the ground one time, my my folks, uh, <clears throat> well, at first they walked out to make sure I hadn't blown myself up and I was still in one piece. And they would look and say, "Yep, I'm okay." And they would just go back on in. Just make sure you don't blow yourself up, son. And uh, <laughs> you, come, you come in for dinner, right? <laughs> come in for dinner right. when you're done. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, so that was a lot of uh, a little bit of the sort of growing interest, uh, you know, at, at you know at you know at home. Of course, when I took chemistry in high school, I had uh, you know exceptionally great. Uh, Chemistry teacher. Her name was uh, Mrs. Irene Martin, uh, and and I also had a, an exceptional physics teacher, uh, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, no Bartlett, uh, and Mr. Bartlett. So he was really interesting, and cool. One of the things he would do is allow kids who were interested in science or developing a project to come out to his house. He had a, a big machine shop and. And if you want to make something, you can go out there and just make it, you know, of course, under his supervision. Uh, now, what it meant was that you had to get out there somehow. And what I would do is get on my bike and cycle about maybe 
10 or 15 miles out to his house and uh, just spend the day in the machine shop making stuff with him, just hanging out and doing cool things. And at the end, he would just sort of, uh, if it got too dark, he'd put my stuff in the back of his truck and drive me back uh, uh, home. So it was a real good sense and, uh, of exploration and, uh, you know, trying, you know, different things and exploring different things, but having that freedom to, to do so. It was a, a great community. Good. And then what came next? Did you go to college? After you graduated, you went to college? Yeah. So what happened was, I'll, I'll tell you uh, some interesting things. I'll, you know, I, I had not really thought about college um, uh, up until my senior year. I hadn't really thought about college, to be honest with you. Hadn't even applied to a college and get into my senior year. Um, and so, uh, but what happened was, uh, in my junior year, I was uh, riding my bike over to the local college. It was Lamar University. Uh, and I was hanging around in the chemistry department. And uh, a professor came up and wanted to know uh, what I was doing. And I, I just sort of knew that, you know, local kids were not supposed to hang around on the college campus. And I thought I was going to get kicked off. Um, but uh, he was curious of what I was looking at and what I was doing, and I told him, well, I was looking at the chemistry exams and see what the college kids do, and and so he wanted to know where I went to high school, so I told him. So he said, well, follow me, and, and he took me to his uh, chemistry lab and um, showed me around. And he showed me the instrumentations that he worked with. He explained to me what they did. And so on a, uh, a napkin, like a coffee napkin, he sort of sketched out the instrument that, that he was working. It was a gas chromatograph. And we were talking, I thought it was a cool idea, it's a cool instrument. And, um, and so I took the napkin and uh, I went to the library to find out a little bit about the gas chromatograph and how I could actually make one. And then I uh, start going to the city dump, going through, you know, whatever's there, the whatever's whatever. there to sure. find, um, you know, parts. And I actually assembled my own homemade gas chromatograph uh, just by going to the library, reading books sure. and etc., and, and having a sketch. And my chemistry and physics teacher thought that was so cool and fascinating. He said, well, write up a report. And I drafted up a report. I got some help uh, um, from one of the student teachers uh, who was at the school a little bit. And, and, uh, and so after I did that, they entered that into some science fair contests and some state competitions. And I actually ended up uh, placing uh, second in state, um, and uh, I even won some money, uh, and I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. With this science stuff, you can actually make some money doing this. <laughs> At home, I can do it, go, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a whole project. <laughs> um, and so, uh, that, of course, that caught the attention uh, uh, of uh, a few, you know, university recruiters, and sure. and of course, my uh, now I realized behind the scenes, my both my chemistry and physics teacher are really, you know, promoting me. And one day, I remember, um, we just finished evening dinner with my folks, and we were just talking about. Um, college, I think this was like in February, and what I was going to do about college and where I was going to go. And, you know, they hadn't saved up anything, and and I didn't realize either that I hadn't even applied. Um, this is and, almost graduation. That's yeah, great. this is okay. almost graduation, yeah, and didn't know where I was going to go. I know I didn't want to stay home. I didn't want to go to Houston, which was a little bit too close to Beaumont, it's about 87 miles. And I was still trying to figure it all out. And I thought, well, maybe what I'll do is join on the Merchant Marines and do a little bit of traveling, uh, et cetera. 
But what happened was um, um, I got a call from uh, the guy's name was uh, Professor Thomas Edgar, who was in the chemical engineering faculty at University of Texas. And I said, well, how would you like to start University of Texas? We'd like to offer you a uh, you know, fellowship. It's not a complete fellowship, but we'd like to offer that to you to come. And, and um, you can start in the summer. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll take it. And I had no clue what the University of Texas was. This is in Austin. In right? Austin. Okay. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know where Austin was. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, I said, well, I asked him, how far was Austin from Beaumont? He said, well, about 250 miles, and I calculated that it would take my parents about four hours to get there. So I thought that was a reasonable enough distance to give me a little, <laughs> bit, <laughs> a little, space. A little space, and they couldn't get there, you know, every weekend or, or every day. Right. So I thought that's a great place to go. So it's <laughs> totally... Totally, you know, uh, random. I'm really uh, away. Uh, yeah. Um, but w once I started looking at University of Texas and started talking to people, uh, they were saying, oh, it's just too big. You know, you know I don't want to go there. I want to go to a place smaller. And, you know, this is where you should think about doing because, you know, get lost in the numbers. It's an unfriendly place. Not many African Americans go to University of Texas. It has a really... Um, rough history, um, and et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I thought about all that, and I, I started to look at it from my own perspective. I, I liked the idea of large classes because I wanted to get lost. And I said, if, if you're in a large class, ah, you have Social Security numbers, so you don't have to worry about whatever racism that may very well be there. They can't, they can't really identify you in a sea, sea of people. Well, I actually r learned that that was not quite the case. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, the, the, those were some of my naive thinking uh, at the time, so I went on to, to uh, University of Texas. But before I leave the high school days, uh, I should say that there was a very important individual that I met that was very... Uh, really was a major figure that uh, forced a real turning point for me in, uh, you know, in, in those days. Um, and that was uh, a chance meeting with uh, uh, Professor Richard Price, who was on the faculty at uh, Lamar University in mathematics. One day he was actually walking past our house and I just finished uh, my dinner and I walked outside to go and uh, you know play with my animals and you know take the dogs out for a walk and he was standing in front of our yard looking at a map he was trying to find us a direction of where did you where recognize him did you know no he was? no I didn't just know who he was there. Okay. I didn't know who he was there was just a guy standing in front of our yard looking at a map looking lost and I knew the community very well, sure. so I went out and said, well, could I, could I assist you? And, uh, and he, you know, I said, well, look, I can get you there, so we'll walk together, and I want to find out a little bit about him. And, and uh, so we started, and that turned out to be very, very important because it turned out to be a, a real lifelong mentor, uh, but someone who really, at that time, which was during my sophomore year, in high school, got me on on track. Actually, it was between freshman and sophomore year. He really got me on track to uh, prepare myself for right. for college. Even though I didn't, still hadn't thought about where I was gonna want to gonna go. And I always wonder what happened if I had stopped at the refrigerator. You know, and he had gone on. Right. You know where sometimes I sometimes those be, chance things turn out to be so great. Oh yeah, you know, just yeah. Like the, it's serendipity, really. It truly is. Uh, you know, you hear stories about people being in the in the wrong place in the wrong time. For me, this is a situation where I was in the right place at the at mm -hmm. the right time. That you know, it, it was a life-altering you know experience. 
just for a nice, uh, nice walk. Right. Um, worked out really very well yeah, for you. Yeah, worked out nice. very, very well. Right. Is he still alive? Yes, he was oh. very much so. He's st still very much so alive. Good. And, uh, and so whenever I go down to Beaumont, you know, I always make sure I stop sure. in and yeah. and see uh, see Doc. We call him Doc. Okay. Uh, now let's go to Austin, right? Yeah. Did you take a look before you actually registered, or did you register and then stay on at school? Did you have a look before you? No, ne out? never went there. Never went there uh, until uh, classes started. Yeah. And you got, so, okay. so what happened was, and it was very interesting. Um, 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 I went there. Well, actually, after I graduated from high school, the night in which I graduated, the next day, next morning, we had packed up the car to, to take off to Austin. And actually, on the way going to Austin, uh, my grandfather had a heart attack uh, just outside of Houston, and I was driving. So I had to basically uh, uh, go over to Galveston, and we got him to Galveston just in time. Um, and uh, ooh, that was that was a real close one. So he had a heart attack, uh, and I felt bad because I had to get to to uh, to Austin to to get registered and start classes. And there he was uh, in the hospital, and grandmother was there. And actually, my father came over and said, "So what they did was they they put me on a bus to go to Austin." And they stayed there uh, to take care of my grandfather. And um, so I got to Austin, uh, managed to find my way to campus, go on in, and uh, and uh, the dorm I stayed in had something like about three thousand five hundred, you know, students, and it. it was huge. Uh, got to take uh, start the classes. And uh, so I got got all all going, and so that was uh, it was good. Had a good uh, you know semester. I enjoyed chemistry. Um, it started off in chemical engineering, uh, so you know it was it was all pretty good, all exciting. I really really enjoyed it. Got to see Austin, my first time you know going outside of Beaumont, uh, sure. you know, a bit. So it was. It really? was a big experience for me. Mm -hmm. What were some then? Uh, what was your course then? And tell us a little bit more about uh, your activities and the course of study. At, at yeah, you so stayed there all four years. Yeah, I stayed there the whole four years. Um, so what happened was, uh, at the end of the summer, uh, one of the professors. Um, well, well, let me let me let me step back. In that, in that first uh, half of the summer, I took a chemistry course. Uh, it was under Dr. Uh, Raymond E. Davis. And um, again, I was the type of kid, I didn't like to sit in the front, but I was not going to sit in the back. And I liked the large numbers, so I could just sort of hide out the numbers kind of bit. And I thought, you know, this professor would never know me. Uh, I never introduced myself to him. Um, but uh, one day I went to go and pick up my exam, and um, and he w was taking all the exams back, and uh, and so he said, uh, "You don't have to worry about your exam, you know. Um, uh, you know, it, your your grade won't change." And I thought, "Now, what does that mean?" But the more shocking reality was that he knew who I was. <laughs> and that wasn't supposed to happen <laughs> it, but it in this does. large class of 350 students. So I, that, that, was, that was just a, that was a shock. So you never know. You never know, you know. <laughs> and, um, so uh, now it turned out that my exam forced a regrade of the entire you know, class, uh, and I didn't realize that until, you know, afterwards uh, what what had happened. And so, yeah, my grade didn't change because I got it right, and it. Um, so. So at the at the end of the summer, what happened was uh, uh, 
Professor Davis said, I'd like to you to stop by in my office at the beginning of the fall. And I thought, well, why would he want me to come by his office? You know, did I do something wrong or, you know, what had happened? So he, uh, I did. And uh, he said, well, I'd like to just sort of tell you a little bit about what I do. So he started to tell me a little bit about the research that he does and that he did at the time. And, and he uh, showed me the instrument that he worked on. He was doing x-ray crystallography work where he uses uh, x-rays to scatter off crystals and the scattering of the uh, x-rays by the crystal. Uh, from that scattering information, you can back out information about the structure of molecules within the, st within the crystal. And he showed me how they construct the structure of molecules. Well, that was exciting because all the stuff you learn in textbook actually came alive. And you can see them in, in three d dimensions and, and you can see how, how they determine that. And it made all the mathematics, and made all the chemistry, made all the physics important. You know, and it all and, comes together. And it all comes together, and that was exciting. Then he said, "Well, I would like you to do some undergrad research, and uh, and uh, come and work with me doing undergrad research." And I just thought that was cool. But the real cool thing was he gave me a key to the building, and plus I had a key to an office with a desk in it and my own desk. And, you know, how many freshmen, you know, had a key to the building and an office, and, you know. And that was, for me, that was, that was the big thing, you know. Right. Um, We're moving up. Yeah, moving up, uh, <laughs> kind of. Up and over. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, up and out, but up and over. <laughs> so I got to do undergrad research, and I didn't realize just how important that was because in that uh, research laboratory were graduate students and postdocs. And there was one other undergraduate student. And, um, and so there was a lot of mentoring. And at the same time, I also got to see what graduate students do, you know, and they got to start to learn about the research process. So by the time I became a sophomore, um, I had already decided I was going to go to graduate school. I had already decided I was going to go to graduate school. The question was where I was going to go sure. to, to graduate school. Uh, and then what Ray also did was he encouraged me to go and do uh, some undergraduate research uh, during the summers away from University of Texas. He wanted me to get a little experience outside the state. So I applied for an undergraduate uh, research experience at uh, Argonne National Laboratory, say my sophomore. And they normally take only juniors and seniors. Uh, but I, they made an exception by taking the sophomore, and that was me. And I went up there uh, for, that was in summer 1975. So I, that was uh, a good experience. Uh, but getting there was interesting um, because uh, you had to pay for your own ticket to get there and they reimburse you, but I didn't have enough money. So I remember trying to figure out, well, how am I going to get money to pay for the train, I mean, plane ticket to get to Chicago. So I went around Beaumont uh, asking for a summer job for about a month just to make enough money to pay for a plane ticket to go to Chicago. And I got a summer job cleaning air conditioners for Sears and Robux. And the first um, uh, job I had to do was go to the neighboring town called Vider, Texas, uh, and clean the air conditioner. I was really petrified about that because Vider, Texas is uh, sort of a major clan uh, stronghold in, uh, in, in Texas. And African Americans and kids learn very early, you don't want to go there. <laughs> and I had to go there. And, uh, and I didn't want to get out of the truck to go clean the air conditioner. Uh, but, you know, my boss, uh, you know, he was there with me and, uh, you know, we, we, we got, you know, through that experience. I didn't know if I was going to come out alive or, or whatever, right. but I did. Were and, these home air conditioners or company gear? Uh, home air conditioners, yeah, oh, home air conditioners, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. 
So um, I made enough money, uh, got a plane ticket, uh, uh, flew up to Chicago. That's my first time on an airplane um, and then <laughs> into Chicago. And it was a wonderful experience. It turned out that uh, my roommate at, uh, at Argonne National Laboratory, his name is Gary Brugvik, uh, is currently the chair at Yale, uh, Department of Chemistry at Yale. And uh, some of the other classmates, uh, you know, from, from, from that group are also chairs at major departments uh, Good in context, medical school. Right? Oh, yeah it, was, yeah, it was a great... Did they provide group. housing right they there? Provide, they provided housing, you okay. know, for us, and it was good. But it was great, you know, I was in the big city, you know. Uh, uh, actually, we stayed in Naperville, but, you know, they, yeah, you very close. Some, uh, you're very close and you can have some outings to Chicago, but working at Argonne National Laboratory, National Laboratory was just super and a great, great experience. Uh, so after that, went back to University of Texas, um, and uh, I did uh, I switch uh, laboratories and did undergrad research in Professor Joe Legowski's um, uh, laboratory. Joe was doing inorganic chemistry, and I thought that would sort of be fun and and sort of cool, just to broaden the experience sure. a bit, and. Uh, I learned a lot about research from from him, but what Joe would do, and and it's something I do with a lot of my own students now. Uh, uh, he was curious about your thought processes. He wanted to know how you thought about a problem. You know, what did you do to solve the problem, and how did you come up with that kind of direction, and then what did you find out from that? Mm -hmm. So. You know, every every periodically he wanted to just sit down and just talk to me about uh, what was my thinking and how do I get there? How'd you go about it? How'd you go about it? Um, and so he was not he wasn't the type who just said you got to be in the lab, be in the lab, be in the lab. But what are you doing in the lab? You know, what is it that, that you're doing? And, and what's the objective? And what's the objective? Sure. And he wanted you to you know figure that out. He didn't want to tell you a lot of stuff. Yep. But he's curious about your your own thinking, and I find myself doing a lot of that with my with my own students, uh, et cetera. And that that's a that's a good thing. That's what right. the whole process is all about. Um, but um, it was coming down to uh, my senior year, and I knew I was going to start applying for graduate schools, um, and so. I started thinking about, well, where I would go. And at the time, I was thinking about going to University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I was thinking about uh, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I was thinking about Rice because it was still in the state of Texas. So uh, all my professors said, we will not let you stay in the state of Texas. Uh, and they had a little policy that they're good students who are all uh, forced out, you know, and they were pushed out of the, of the state. And uh, only if you, under exceptional circumstances, would they allow you to uh, recommend that you stay within in the state. So it turned out my, my study partners uh, from my freshman year all the way up to we graduated from Texas, was a little study group, about five of us, five of us in that, no, six of us in that group, uh, two young ladies and four four guys. Um, it turned out that uh, w one of my study partners uh, is, is, was actually former head of University of Illinois. One of them was also on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley. One was a head at uh, Carleton College, and then myself, and then the two young ladies. One went off to, to medical school. And, and we lost contact with the other, but it turned out to be a little special mm -hmm. group. Sounds like it. Yeah. And uh, we we're all still in, in 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 contact with each other. But they had all gotten admitted to uh, applying to Berkeley, and um, so I decided I'd also apply to Berkeley, as, you know, as well. But that was it. Uh, I was sort of keen on Wisconsin, so um, my professors arranged for me to talk to. 
the dean, uh, no, the chair of the department in Wisconsin uh, at the time, <clears throat> and um, he interviewed me and and uh, said, well, you know, I got some very positive recommendations from all your professors, and he said, uh, what are other schools you were considering? And I told him, he said, look, you're going about this the wrong way. You only have one good school on there, and that's uh, Berkeley for what you're interested in doing. And he said, the individuals that you want to work at Wisconsin are all retiring, so for what you want to do, Wisconsin was not the right place. And I was a little disappointed with that. So, um, so I, I, you see, I asked him, where should I go? He said, well, you should apply to Berkeley. Right? So you, you should consider Stanford, and you should consider uh, in MIT. So all the places that he suggested I, I consider, I, I, I applied to, and I got into all of them. <laughs> and, yeah, and I didn't really think I could, but I did. Um, and in fact, uh, my whole study group, we got it all to the same places. Now initially, I was going to go to um, Berkeley to you know, go with uh, you know, my friends. Um, and I had accepted and I had turned down the other, other schools. But about two weeks before graduation, my grandfather died. And, um, and so um, yeah, I didn't graduate you know, on time. I had to sort of defer it until the summer. Um, and, uh, and I kept you know, Berkeley informed of what was going on. And then I decided that I didn't have to take uh, you know a year off, try to you know work and pay off some of the expenses. I couldn't see. I couldn't. I felt rather bad going off to grad school, leaving my grandmother the way she you know in a sort of financial strain. So I t got deferment, and um, and um, uh, took a job at Monsanto. And uh, there was, was this some, in Beaumont? This was actually in Texas City, so I was commuting between oh. Texas City and Beaumont, um, just trying to get everything set. Sure. Then there was some tension between uh, me and my uncle, and he lived out in Berkeley. And I thought that would just create uh, a little bit of a difficult situation, him living so close to Berkeley, and then um, me going to school there that I really need to sort of be free of, of, of yeah. some of that. So I called up MIT and explained the situation to them and said, I know I turned you down, but you know, here are the circumstances. So they said, look, we'll readmit you and just come on to MIT. And that's how I went. <laughs> and I went to MIT. Um, uh, the guiding thing on that, because I knew no one there. Uh, there were no family you know, members there. I knew no one there, and was just, you know, sort of free of a lot of it. Now, I reckon that you know MIT and Berkeley—they're pretty much, when you look at everything, they're excellent schools. They're the top schools. They have pretty much the same, you know, faculty. Uh, that whether I went there or the other, it really didn't matter in terms of the experience. Uh, but for me, what was important was. Um, um, being free from distractions right. that would, you know, really uh, compromise how I performed. Sure. Starting fresh. Yeah, starting fresh. Right. And I'm, I'm always, you know, haven't had that experience, gone through that. You know, I always. Uh, you know, mindful of students who are going through these kind of right. situations, what they must do and, and how they have to think. So I usually try to challenge them that they're sort of growing up a little bit and they need to think about, you know, their future and, and preparing for, for their future. It's tough and it's hard thinking about that, but um, that's sort of... You have to. You have to, right. you know, and, and uh, so very few people tell them that, but. Right. I do because I had that experience. But nevertheless, uh, so I went off to MIT and um, I started there. Uh, had never been there. 
Yeah, and, you know, et cetera, and so You come to the to, Northeast. Coming up to the Northeast, and, uh, you know, it was a very interesting. Um, and so, um, tell you a funny story about that if we have time. Sure. Uh, I remember. Um, did you take the train or did you fly? Well, no, I, I took a bus up to Boston, um, and, uh, you know, I took a little trip up there. So just take a look at it uh, in the spring, even though I had, and I had already accepted. And uh, and so down in Texas in March, it was you know about 80 degrees, and so everybody's wearing short sleeve t-shirts and shorts, etc. So I get on the bus, and uh, you know in Austin, and heading up to uh, to Boston, and get outside New York, and it's a little cold but we're early in the morning and usually mornings are a little a little crisp and but you get out of the bus go into the bus station where it's warm and you wait until you board your your bus to the bus to Boston so and we the bus gets outside of Boston sort of in Wellesley and I remember this very vividly and I said wow this is beautiful and I look out in the lake and there are chunks of ice floating around in the lake so I start calculating now what temperature must it be outside for that ice to be floating around. And I have a short sleeve shirt and shorts on. <laughs> this is March, right? Or <laughs> this is March. So we, got, we go to the, bus, to the bus station, and as we're driving in downtown Boston, people were wearing fur coats and downs. And I said, uh, but I don't have that, so I have to wait until I get my luggage. And I think I brought a sweater. I can do a quick change. <laughs> but it turned out that um, they left my luggage in New York. <laughs> um, so I had to go up to Boston, to MIT in a short sleeve and shorts. And, of course, they were like, did we admit this guy? You know. <laughs> I'm from Texas. Here I am, right? Here I am. Sure. <laughs> <He's just> cold. <laughs> ah, here we go. Uh, so that was that was my uh, you know first awakening to uh, to the Northeast and Boston and cooler uh, weather and cooler weather. Um, but I had a great experience uh, at MIT. Um, one of the things that happened there with the research that I was doing. Uh, there was a, a professor in Australia who was very interested in, in what we were publishing. And he came over to Boston on his way, stopped over in Boston on his way to a conference in New Hampshire to see my advisor and see me and have a little discussion. He was doing throughout, developing theoretical models to explain how lasers interact with molecules to uh, put enough energy into the molecule from the laser beam to induce chemistry. And um, and we were doing all experiments, but we were trying to interpret those experiments, and he had a good, cool theoretical model that allows us to make those interpretations. And uh, so he invited me to come to Australia um, and do some research. Well, that was sort of cool because I'd never been out of the country before. And uh, uh, he said, well, I'll ask your advisor if that's okay to do, if you can you know, have some time. Now, one of the nice things, I had a fellowship at MIT, so that gave me flexibility to, to do that. It was just if, you know, uh, he would uh, agree to that, and he did. So I took off and went to Australia for over a half a year uh, doing research at University of Sydney and also University of Adelaide. Um, and that was just a wonderful like experience. How oh, fortunate. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually those ties still continue. So about every two, three years, I go back to, to Australia. Um, and so, um, so I, I still do that. And that was because of those, those ties that right. were developed uh, there. But my advisor in Australia, um, I remember when I gave my final talk in University of Sydney, uh, he said, uh, well, what, what are you going to do? What about your future? And where are you going to go? And what are you going to do? I said, well, 
you know, I think I will go and postdoc, and I got a postdoc in the U.S. someplace, and he said, no, I don't think you should do that. I think uh, you should leave the country, you should leave the U.S. and uh, uh, go over to Europe, and uh, you know, I didn't know exactly where. So we started some conversations about where I would go, and he started me to look at, uh, you know, some places to go. So um, when I got back and, and I was talking to my research advisor at MIT about my future, um, uh, he thought going abroad would be a good good thing uh, for me. And the question was just where. So I, when I started looking, I had an opportunity to, I actually had three offers. Uh, one was to work at Max Planck Institute in Munich as a researcher. One was to work at Oxford University. In fact, the professor came over to the U.S. to visit me and to recruit me to go to, to Oxford. And the other one was Cambridge University uh, to, to go there. Um, and so I decided I would go to Cambridge University. Um, and so in 83, um, actually January of 83, I packed up my bags and went over to Cambridge University and, uh, and started uh, postdoctoral experience there. Now the, the interesting thing about that, so I get to Cambridge and I get off the train uh, from London to Cambridge and I felt I was walking back into the 17th century. <laughs> you know, all the nothing really changed. Uh, mm -hmm. It looked, you know, like it was whatever. I was walking back in history. And then I actually find my way to my college. That was Christ College that I was in. They put me up in the old part of the college. I was sort of built in 14 or whatever. Of course, they don't have central heating or air conditioning, you know. It's all original. It's all original. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I remember this vividly. I had a space heater, that, and it was running day and night, and it, and it wasn't seemed like it was heating up very much. <laughs> they don't throw a lot of heat. Uh -uh. <laughs> Not like central air. Or Not central like heat. central air. <laughs> so I remember having to go and get some extra blankets and a wool sweater, and I was sleeping in a wool sweater and extra wool blankets, and the space heat was going all night sure. just to sort of keep warm. And I said, and I turned down going, staying in the U.S. for this. What <laughs> was I thinking? Um, so I decided I had to, uh, and then I guess the thing that was a real turning point is I wanted to go have a shower, and I was told that in the old part of college there wasn't, and that uh, it was, you, know, you had to go to the new part. So what it means, you have to go out the old part, cross over a little bridge to the new part, go take your shower, and then you come back, you know, and it's quite cool. And, Right. And uh, that that just wasn't uh, my experience, uh, you know, idea of a, a great uh, living arrangement. Uh, I, I didn't want to live back in the 15th century. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I, I managed to switch colleges, and I got a fellowship at St. Edmunds College, and which was a newer college, uh, as a as a research fellow. And that just uh, made life much, much, much Sounds better. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, but the research experience was really great. I liked the, the freedom and the flexibility that I had. Um, I also got to meet some, you know, good uh, young colleagues, and you know, they're always around tea time. We get together and talk about new ideas and sure. what research was going on that was exciting and um, what we were doing and you know, what we would do different, uh, uh, et cetera. And those, those are really good. And, and actually those experiences, I've developed some lifelong colleagues that, that we still collaborate to this very day, good. you know, from, from that experience. But it was in that experience there that uh, allowed me to sort of uh, not only get some additional ex experimental experience in the research uh, and looking at uh, how molecules interact with lasers and what do they do and when you put energy in the molecules what is that where does mm -hmm. that energy go and how does that energy flow in impact uh, the chemistry 
But I also was introduced to new radical, new theoretical tools that were being developed at Cambridge, um, and um, and that was exciting. And I asked the professor, could I learn about that? And he said, sure. And he gave me a computer account and just allowed me to work with some of the students. Right. And and so uh, that turned out to be a very important experience because it allowed me to integrate and define my own uniqueness by bringing in both an experimental and a theoretical uh, foundation to the research that we're doing in, in chemistry. And the aim was how to m use both of those uh, tools and experiences to forge some new chemistry. And it was there that I thought about a new direction of bringing those new state-of-the-art tools from uh, physical chemistry, experimental physical chemistry, and theoretical chemistry to bear on atmospheric chemistry problems to look at uh, what a chemical transformation is going on in the atmosphere at a molecular level. And that's actually formed the whole research basis of, of, of my career, um, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So, uh, you know, from that, uh, I managed to get a postdoc back in the U.S. at MIT. And MIT was really wonderful by giving me the postdoc, primarily to help me to transition back to the U.S. to look for jobs. And then I got a job at, uh, at Wayne State University. And one of the things I liked about Wayne State when I interviewed uh, there, I saw excellent facilities, great students. I felt the facilities and students were underutilized, and boy, could I take advantage of that. But one of the things I really liked about the, the department uh, was that they, some departments, they hire you to do a particular job X, and they want you to become expert in, in that, that job. Yeah. Well, what Wayne did was they hired you to be a good chemist. They, whatever you decide to do, you, you should be good at that. And for me at the time, that was a that was good thing because that allowed me to sort of define my own sort okay. of niche area, right. which hadn't really been clearly defined. Um, and so, so the key was to define it and become very good at it. Um, and that was... Uh, really good. Now I didn't realize that that department had a very interesting history. Um, 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 Herb Brown produced Nobel Laureate. Uh, that was his first faculty position. Uh, Carl Gerasi, the guy who uh, discovered the birth control pill, you know, he got his start at Wayne State before moving to Stanford. Um, and uh, there have been about maybe two or three other National Academy of Science members Very got good. their start, you know, there, but then they, they moved they sure. moved on. Uh, I didn't realize that, you know, but, it, you know, it was until much later. But uh, in a way, you can sort of see and understand that by, you know, what they really try to do, a, a, a good job of identifying very young faculty and give them that sort of freedom and flexibility to sort right. of define, you know, them, their, their, their niche in the, in the field. Um, and that was really was good. Um, but I was defining my niche in, 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 the, in the area. And, of course, that was a little bit of a challenge, you know, because atmospheric chemists are very territorial <laughs> and protective of their area. And I was coming in as a sort of a fundamentalist uh, uh, bit. And, and so it was a little tough going in, in, in doing that. But I actually had a very good alliance uh, that I made through just a, uh, a contact with a colleague at a meeting. Um, and his name was Fred Shear, who was at Caltech at the time. And it was just on the, in the cab going to the airport. We were talking. and. He wanted to know what I was doing, and uh, and I explained to him. So he said, "Well, you know, you sh do you know these individuals at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory?" I said, "No." He said, "Well, you know, I think you should meet them. I think uh, 
So he arranged for me to come out to Caltech and JPL to, to meet the, the cast of uh, characters at, at JPL. And that turned out to be very important um, because I realized uh, that they had experience in the knowledge base that I didn't have, that I needed. Uh, I knew they were very successful and I wanted to know why they were very successful. Uh, I, I learned, you know, that, but but I also brought some new tools and a, and a, and, a, and a direction that they hadn't exploited anyway, and they didn't have that expertise. And at the same time, too, there were some rather doubts about it uh, because it was all very young, a very young, you know, area and 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 and, and you know, untested tools. And I was coming in, we were going to test it. And of course, having our own experience, experimental expertise, we can do all the testing in-house right. and validation in-house, which turned out to be very important to, to have done. But JPL was very important in forming that collaboration uh, with me. Uh, and that actually gave some affirmation to what we're doing. Uh, but those actually have developed into lifelong collaborations. Even to this day, we, we, we collaborate. So at the time, when I was assistant professor, every summer I was out at uh, JPL. And they actually uh, gave me full reign of the JPL computers to do all the work we needed to get done. Great. And the arrangement was that you can do our own work, but we're also assisting with their problems. And I thought that was, that was good because the more we can help them use the tools to validate the experiments, that validated what we were doing sure. theoretically as, as, it as well. Ways, yeah. It goes, we work back both ways. And we can help each other right. in, uh, as well. But uh, that, that turned out to be rather exciting. We tackled some important problems. Um, and I learned uh, you know, some very important aspects of atmospheric chemistry. And we tackle a real tough problem at the time, and with the approach that we took, we were able to really bring some new insight and new understanding to the problems. And of course, uh, that got some worldwide attention, and that also got the attention of Purdue University. And uh, <clears throat> and so in '94, I actually came and interviewed at Purdue, and. Um, and I was invited to, to join the faculty, um, and, uh, and I said yes. Now, after I said yes, I wondered if I had done the right thing, because uh, the chemistry department at Purdue is, uh, you know, is, is world-renowned, sure. excellent faculty, and, um, and the challenge for me was to, you know, make sure I do a very, very good job, but I have to always do that, and that was gonna be the, the challenge. And I was wondering, you know, I did a, I got lucky a little bit, made some interesting discovery, came up with some new things, but could I continue that, sure. you know, right. which you is do. necessary, you yeah. know, to, to really, um, uh, yeah, sort of expected of all the faculty at, at, at right. Purdue, and mm -hmm. that, was a, that was gonna be my, mm -hmm. my challenge. Were you married by that time? Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, I got okay. married in um, um, in '93. Okay. Did you meet your wife at at Wayne State? Okay. Yeah. Um, Big pardon. Two minutes we have. Oh, okay. Good. That's okay. It. We may have to do we may have to do this in two parts. But go okay, ahead. Finish right. that part. Go ahead. All right. So Coming yeah, so we met at Wayne State. Okay. Um, and uh, and then we got married. Uh, you know, at Wayne State, and then she decided to follow me on over to Purdue, and so uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, we'll, we'll stop here now. Okay. It's okay. All right. uh, thank I'll you, Wayne. We can do this, we'll schedule another part. We've got other things to cover. So can I be all with you? Oh, that's fine. Good, okay, good.